birthdays and Christmas, I used to have you on my wish list. Held my girls the first time and looked them in their eyes and thought to myself, what kind of fool would ever miss this? Now, I ain't asked for you to sleep with mom and make me, plus I'm your blood. Why would you leave? What was so important? They told you smash broads and roll up the weed. I guess that buzz had you high enough to float over me. Dang. I hope that every dollar that you made, every girl that you slayed, when you close your eyes at night, I hope you say it's all worth it. Every graduation birthday game that you missed, I hope what you got instead makes you feel it's all worth it. Being a father is expensive and the cost you may ignore it, but know that me and your grandchildren are paying for it. Can't ask myself what did dad do in hard times, because that means they'll be writing one of these rhymes. I've often heard it said, how y'all doing, you good? <laughs> I've often heard it said that preaching is simply truth poured out through personality. And so I want there to be no mistake about the personality, the, the filter, the conduit from whom you receive today. Um, I was born about an hour and a half away from here. Um, small city, San Francisco, maybe you've heard of it. But I'm from a, a district called Fillmore. Now, when many of us think of uh, San Francisco, we think of uh, affluence, and affluent it is. But that is not the case where I'm from. <clears throat> where I'm from, that this small community in Fillmore, um, though it is surrounded by some of the greatest uh, tourist attractions and venues in the country, you've got the Painted Ladies, uh, you've got USF, the University of San Francisco, you've got the Fillmore, uh, you've got the Golden Gate Bridge. You've got Fort Mason and just beyond that, Alcatraz Island. You've got the Great American uh, Music Hall. You've got the Bay Bridge, the Warfield. Even Twitter's headquarters surrounds that community. But if you zoom in and zero in on my community right off of Golden Gate Avenue in McAllister, you will find a Section 8 low-income complex called Frederick Douglass Haynes Gardens Apartments. Uh, the saving grace of this complex is the fact that most of the units, a majority of the units, are stacked on top of each other and built in the form of a square with gates just to provide enough of a buffer between the, the rampant drug uh, infestation and, and uh, gang activity happens right on the other side of it. And of the 104 units in that complex, my family, my grandmother, my mother, and my two aunts occupied four of them. Now, I didn't have a daddy, so my mom, she was working full time and putting herself through nursing school. And so she would shuffle me throughout these units uh, constantly, all the time. I was going to, to my aunt's house, my grandma's house. I was shuffled all between. And eventually, I, I moved in with my aunt full time. And then when I was seven years old, all of us in these four units, we packed up, all of us except my mother, we packed up and we moved to Antelope, California. <laughs> the Lope. We moved to Antelope, California, and we piled into a five-bedroom house. And, I, and I'm just saying, some of my fondest childhood memories is all of us just cramped in that house, and it was amazing. Uh, but, but as I just look back over my life and I think about it, I, I mean, I didn't have a central male figure to shape me and to teach me how to be a man. But what I did is, when I realized that that was my reality, I started to just kind of observe the men that were passing through my life. And I, I just decided that I was going to try to take all the good things that I saw from these men. And, and it didn't even matter who they were. Uh, I mean, just any man who came through, I just wanted to see if I can get just the best things that I saw in them. And it could have been babysitters, uh, my uncles, my cousins, uh, my grandma's boyfriend, my aunt's boyfriends, my mom's boyfriends. I, I had a stepdad for some of my childhood. Uh, it was friends, uh, my friends' dads. Uh, coaches, teachers, my bosses, I mean, anything. It even extended into professional athletes and celebrities and musicians. Anything I saw good that a man was doing, I tried to emulate because I figured if I could just take the best things that they were doing, maybe I could be a man. And then when I was 19 years old, as amazing as many of these men were, by the way, I still found myself lacking. And then... 
there was this category shattering event. When I was 19 years old, I was a freshman in college. I encountered Jesus Christ for the first, right on time. Amen, amen, amen. Right on time. We're doing a series right now called Right on Time. And right on time, Jesus Christ showed up in my life. And, you know, I'm not going to compare myself to a messianic figure. Like, I, I, I don't know if in that moment, you know, the clouds opened up and God spoke from heaven. But it, it sure felt that way. Because I remember God said something very specific to me that I've never been able to shake. He said to me in that moment, Sean, you've been looking for a father your whole life. I'm the one you're looking for. And my search for a father ended that day. But what I found, though, is that I still have this knack. I still have this ability. For whatever reason, I observe men in my life. Uh, I, I observe men. I'm always interested in men's temperaments and their personalities, their character, their actions, their reactions. And so as we look at the Christmas story today, there are so many different angles that I can go from in order to give you some hope and to encourage you. Uh, but, but my natural inclination takes me to one man. His name is Joseph. Joseph was the stepfather of Jesus. See, there are some lessons that we can learn as we look at his responses to Jesus' arrival. See, the, the message of Christmas and really of Christianity as a whole is that Jesus is here. Yeah. Emmanuel, God with us has crash landed into your life like he did Joseph's. And so what are you going to do with him? What are you going to do? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the people of God. I thank you for the opportunity to minister. Hmm. Lord, we need you to show up. We need you to be here. I'm very much aware, Lord, that um, if it's just me that they're hearing today, this whole service is for naught. But, but if you show up, it can change everything. I'm reminded of Peter who uh, said that if anyone speaks, may he speak as if he's speaking the very words of God. Help me with that today. He also says, if anyone serves, may he serve with the strength that God provides. May we do that today. I'm also reminded of something that Martin Luther said, where he said that scripture is the manger in which the Christ lies. So as we open up your word today, may we handle it with the reverence that it deserves. Then he says in that same quote, he says, uh, do, not uh, do not inspect the cot while forgetting to worship the baby in it. Oh God. Do not inspect the cot, but forget to worship the baby in it. Lord, it's Christmas season. There's so much commotion going on. There's so many things that are happening. We've got family to entertain. We've got kids that want gifts, and we're doing everything we can. Some of us are stressed out about how we're going to pull off Christmas for our kids, and some of us have so many presents that we have to start wrapping it, and we're overwhelmed. There, there's some of us who... Uh, who actually get really depressed and really lonely because of the brokenness of relationships around this time of year. There's so much commotion, Lord, and it's very easy in this Christmas season for us to begin to inspect the cot, but forget to worship the baby. Lord, help us to not forget to worship Jesus in this season, that Jesus went from cradle to grave and rose for us. Let us not forget that. May, may this moment right here, right now, signify us just committing ourselves to you afresh in this season. That we will be a blessing, that we will, we will be worshipful in this time. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Again, I want to look at Joseph's life um, and, and I want to look at his response to Jesus' arrival. You'll notice about Joseph, there's not a whole lot that's spoken about him. You have to really dig if you're going to be able to, to, to get anything on Joseph. Um, but he has a response to Jesus' arrival that I think is, uh, is amazing. It's amazing. And so as we look at his response to his arrival, I want you to see three things. I'll give you my points up front. 
Three things. Number one, we're going to look at the faith it took to believe. All right, the faith that it took to believe. Secondly, we're going to look at the ridicule he had to endure. And then thirdly, the family he chose to own. All right, the faith it took to believe, the ridicule he had to endure, the family he chose to own. First, the faith it took to believe. Matthew chapter 1, starting verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. I want you to just take a moment and put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Okay, now, now in our culture, we don't have anything like betrothal. The, the closest thing we have is engagement. So just imagine with me that you get engaged to a girl and then she goes off to hang out with her cousin for a few months and she comes back and she's knocked up like, like pregnant. And then you confront her and she says, oh, no, God did it. <laughs> like, like do, you, do you understand like what Joseph has to go through in this moment? See, s- some people have said uh, that the supreme miracle of Christianity is not the death and resurrection of Jesus, but actually it's the incarnation. That, that listen, you and I, all we have to believe is that Jesus Christ lived, died and rose from the grave. Joseph had to believe that the beginningless, omnipotent creator of the universe showed up on earth in human form as a helpless human baby. Oh, 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 in the belly of his fiance, who he knows he didn't get freaky with. That's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, We hear the word incarnation a lot around this, this time of year. Um, And so I just want to define uh, incarnation. Incarnation, just to be clear, is a term used by theologians uh, to indicate that Jesus, the Son of God, took on human flesh. The the word literally means the act of being made flesh. It's the embodiment of a deity uh, or spirit in some earthly form. Paul, in his second chapter of his letter to the Philippians church, said that Jesus Christ emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. John, in the first chapter of his gospel, says that the word Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, so so when you hear the word uh, incarnation, think of Jesus. Think of God becoming human. Amen? Uh, J.I. Packer, when thinking of the incarnation, he argues, it is from misbelief or at least inadequate belief about the incarnation that difficulties at other points in the gospel story usually spring. But once the incarnation is grasped as a reality, these other difficulties dissolve. In other words, what what Packer is saying to us is if there is a God and if this God became a man, then why would you find it incredible for him to do miracles, to die for the sins of the world or to raise from the dead? That's what he's saying. See, we all want to believe in something outside of ourselves. We do. We want to believe in something. This is the reason why Disney dominates the film industry. Okay. As nauseating as they are to many of us, especially dads of of four girls. Okay. As nauseating as they are. uh, um, Frozen 2 came out and everyone was like, are you going to see it? Are you going to see it? I was like, no. Why? Because I'm going to watch it a hundred times when it comes out. Like, I don't need to go to the theater to see a movie. I'm going to see it a million times. I promise you. Nauseating as they are. The moment they come out with the movie, we all stop what we're doing and go see it, don't we? And so the great, nope. (laughs) But the great movies, okay, you'll follow this, Bob. The great movies like Beauty and the Beast, I know that's your favorite, and and Sleeping Beauty and and Peter Pan and Spider-Man, okay, uh, they didn't really happen. They're not factually true. And yet there seems to be a set of longings in the human heart that realistic fiction can never satisfy. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, he actually makes this point. He says, deep in the human heart, there is a desire to escape death, a desire for the supernatural, a desire for a love that never parts, a desire not to age but to realize our creative dreams a desire to fly, a desire to communicate with non-human beings, a desire to triumph over evil. And the well-told stories, if they have these features, we find them incredibly moving, right? Because although we know these things didn't actually happen, our hearts long for or sense that, you know, that, that, that we really are under enchantment. 
and that we really are under the power of a sorcerer of some sort, that, that we really weren't meant to die, that, that we, really weren't meant to, we really were meant to defeat death. And so we watch movies like Beauty and the Beast, and we sense that uh, there must be a love that can break me out of the beastliness that I've created for myself. We watch Sleep in Beauty and we say, man, I, I, I must be under enchantment of some sort, but there's got to be a noble prince to come who's going to break the enchantment. We watch Spider-Man and we're like, man, I, I wish I could fly. I, I wish I could do something about the injustices of the earth like Andrew does every day. See, these, these movies, these stories, they stir something deep in us. And deep down inside, we believe these things to be true. Now, we don't believe the stories to be true, but, but the underlying realities are, right? And then we open up the Bible and we're introduced to Christmas. And this is a story about what? Someone from outer space? <laughs> Who breaks into this world, has miraculous powers, can calm storms, can raise people from the dead, can heal people. But then his enemies capture him and they put him to death. And it looks like all hope is lost and it's all over. But then he rises from the dead and he saves everyone. And so we read the story and we clap. Great story. What a great story. I mean, wait till Disney gets his hands on this. This is going to be amazing. Bob's going to go see it, I swear. Why? Because we're going to all go to the theater, we're going to sit down, we're going to cheer, and we're going to get up, and we're going to go back to reality. But Christianity says no. Jesus Christ is not yet another fairy tale pointing to these underlying realities. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ is the underlying realities to whom all these other stories point. Come on. <laughs> Jesus is real. Jesus really happened. And if Jesus is true, and he is. And if the Bible is true, and it is, and if Mary's telling the truth about this baby in her womb, and she is, then guess what? There is an evil sorcerer in this world, and we are under enchantment. But there has been a noble prince that has come and broken the enchantment. And you will fly, and you will defeat death, and you will be empowered to do something about the enchantment. Oh, I feel the spirit of God. I wish someone in. Listen, 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 listen. And, and you will, and there is a love that you'll never part from. And, and you will communicate with non-human beings. I mean, look in the Christmas story. Every time you turn around, everyone and their mama is talking to an angel, right? Listen, even though we know that these stories aren't factually true, the fact is that the true story of Jesus makes all the best stories in the ultimate sense true and real but it all started on Christmas, y'all. It all hinged on Joseph, who had to have the faith to believe in the impossible. Amen? Secondly, the ridicule he had to endure. Matthew 1, verse 19, it says, And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he, had, when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus comes into your life, it causes a personal crisis. If when you... Uh, I brought Jesus to your life, if when Jesus came into your life, if you were able just to add him in with no change, um, I would submit to you that Jesus may be your aid. He may be your inspiration. He may even be your homeboy, but he very likely is not your Lord. Because if Jesus is Lord in you, it revolutionizes you. And, and, listen, and that's a good thing, by the way, because you're going to have to endure a lot of negative feedback about your decision. Like, not everyone's going to be a fan of you committing your life to Christ. Not everyone's going to buy in to that idea. Some people are going to think you're weak. That, that coming to Christ actually uh, is weakness in your life. They're going to think that. So some people are going to think that you're being deceived. Some people are going to think that it's just another phase for you. 
And then, and then there are some people who don't want to see you free simply because the, uh, they're the ones who benefit most from your bondage. Let, let me re- rewind that. Some people don't want to see you free simply because they're the ones who benefit most from your bondage. You got people in your life, maybe, smile up in your face every day. They're always around. They may even say they love you. But I'm telling you, go ahead and move them off the throne of your heart and put Jesus in that place. They are going to freak out. Why? Because they're the ones who get the highest commissions off your captivity. Let's just take a moment and worship the Lord. Joseph is in this place where he has to get past this idea of his fiance getting pregnant. But then an angel shows up and he confirms for Joseph that it's true. And now he goes from having to believe in something impossible to now he has a decision to make. Because Joseph knows that if he accepts the call of God, it will mean being misunderstood. It will. One commentator said uh, his decision to stay meant he would have to endure for the rest of his life the ridicule and gossip of neighbors, relatives, and others who rejected the Lord's miraculous conception and believe he married a pregnant fornicator. Uh, Another source said this, that if he goes along with this, that, that there are some people in his community that will actually think, man, they will actually think that he is prostituting his wife as, as a panderer. I mean, it's brutal. Joseph knows that if I go forward with this, I will be a second class citizen forever. It's over. Let me tell you something. If your stellar reputation means everything to you and you will not be misunderstood and you will not be viewed in in an unclear light, then heaven may not be able to birth the will of God in your life. Think about if Joseph spent all his time warning about what other people thought, do you think he would have fathered the son of God? No. No, he wouldn't have. By the end of Matthew chapter one, you'll see that Joseph takes Mary as his wife. So he makes the decision. He says, okay, I'm gonna go forward with this. He takes Mary as his wife, but we don't get but one chapter further into his story. You look in, uh, in Matthew chapter two and you see what King Herod's trying to do. You don't get but one chapter later that he notices that to have Jesus in his life doesn't just mean uh, you know, so, some type of uh, issue with his social standing. It means danger to his very life. So, are you like Joseph? C- could you have done what Joseph did? Yeah? Let's test it. You guys are quiet. <laughs> Let's test it. I want to ask you two questions. Your answers to these questions will give you a good idea of where you're at. Now, when I ask these questions, don't raise your hand. Don't say anything out loud. I don't want you to implicate yourself, okay? Just keep it to yourself. Just internalize the answers to these, okay? Two questions for you. Question number one, are you willing to obey anything that the Bible clearly says to do, whether you like it or not? Are you willing to obey anything that the Bible clearly says to do, whether you like it or not? If you made it past question number one, congratulations. Question number two. Are you willing to trust God in anything he sends into your life, whether you understand it or not? Are you willing to trust God in anything he sends into your life, whether you understand it or not? Listen, if you cannot answer these two questions in the affirmative, then you may believe in Jesus in some general way, but you very likely may have have not said to him, I am your servant, like Mary and Joseph did. Joseph shows us in the Christmas story that to receive Jesus, it's going to take great faith to believe, and you're going to have to endure some ridicule. You will. Amen? The last one. Jason, you can come back. I'm scaring these people. Last one, the choice he made to stay. The choice he made to stay. Luke chapter two, starting in verse 21, it says, 
And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. Jesus. The name given by the angel, remember that, by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And then moving to verse 39, it says, When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, let's recapitulate for a moment. Okay, Let's look at the time frame of Joseph's story. So Joseph, first and foremost, has to deal with the fiance who shows up pregnant. And he has to do some mental gymnastics just to understand how that could even happen, okay? To, to have faith to believe in the impossible. He's got to do that. Then an angel comes and confirms, yes, it's true. God is really doing this, all right? And, and, and he has to make a decision at that point, okay? Am I going to be misunderstood for the rest of my life? Am I going to deal with the ridicule for the rest of my life? But then he wasn't even given the ability to name his son, See, the angel said to him, she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus. So now even Joseph's control over his family is being undermined. Even that, the angel was saying to him in so many words, if Jesus is in your life, you are not his manager. He is your manager. See, if you, if you say, Sean, I want to be a Christian, but I only want to be a Christian if it means that I don't have to do this or that. Do you know what you're doing? You're trying to name the baby. That's what you're doing. You're trying to, you want Jesus on your own terms. But if you're going to have Jesus in your life, you don't control him. He controls you. You don't get to name him. He names you. I mean, are there any stepfathers in the building? who understand how it feels to have no control over your stepchildren. <laughs> don't, don't answer out loud. <laughs> right? Like family life is so tough. Family life is, it is incredibly difficult. It's hard to stay connected to your spouse when you're trying to raise children. It is. It, it's really, now for me, uh, you know, the, a little bit of a benefit I have is that, you know, my, my family issues in my home, they're half my fault, right? Like, like me and Amy, we went half on our babies, right? So like whenever I'm struggling, whenever I'm having a hard time, I can look at my family and say, man, this is my fault. You know what I'm saying? Like family life is really, really tough. But when you're trying to raise children that are not yours biologically, it is tougher still. See, uh, I know God is God. And I know he would have kept his son safe. I know it. He would have kept his son safe. But imagine the disadvantages there would have been for Jesus if Joseph dipped. If Joseph would have left Mary high and dry. Just imagine. I just took a, a few moments and thought about this. Even the son of God would have been disadvantaged. Think about this. Uh, in the shame and honor culture that Mary was living in, she would have been rejected by everyone because she had a child out of wedlock. No man would have married her. No man was gonna bring her into their home and bring the shame onto them. No man was gonna do that. Even her own parents would have found it very difficult to house her and to take care of her. They would have to face scorn and they would have to, to take on the financial burden of their daughter and now newfound grandson. You could think about the prophecies about the Messiah that would be at risk. The prophets predicted that the Messiah would visit Bethlehem in Egypt. Uh, Bethlehem is where he was born. That's Joseph's hometown. How would Jesus have gotten there? How would Jesus, if Mary was a single mother, how would he have gotten to Egypt? I mean, that would have been a, a, a bigger miracle than some of the stuff we see in scripture for this single mother to do these things. And then think about crazy old King Herod. Think about King Herod. When the Magi shows up on his porch asking for the newborn king of the Jews, who was going to keep Mary and this child safe from the crazy tyrant? What I'm trying to say to you is even the son of the living God, had he not had his earthly father, he would have been incredibly disadvantaged. Even the son of God. 
there are major disadvantages for not having a father around to shape you. I remember so badly just wanting my uncle and my cousin to accept me. I, I just remember being at a really impressionable age where I just so badly wanted a father around. I wanted my dad. I did. And I'm just telling you right now, had he been there, it would have meant everything. I would have gave him my heart. If he would have told me to jump off a bridge, I would have did it. If he would have told me to serve God, I would have did it. But instead, it was my grandma who put a Bible in my hand. It was my aunt who showed me what a provider looks like. It was the TV that showed me what relationships look like. It was my best friend who taught me how to shave. It was my best friend that taught me how to tie tie. It was my best friend's dad who sent me off to prom. It was my boss who taught me work ethic. It was my wife that taught me unconditional love. It's my current boss who taught me how to be a professional. And because Jesus showed up right on time, I do not look like where I've been. It could not have been easy. It could not have been easy to, ra to raise the son of God. I know it. it. Couldn't have been. But for me, the most impressive and admirable thing about Joseph is that he stayed. <laughs> Joseph shows us in the Christmas story that your best contributions to this world, your best contributions to your community, your best contributions to your neighborhood may not be you. It may be the little ones growing up in your home. For Joseph to stay was an all-in decision. There was no contingency plan. There was no plan B. Joseph and Mary centered their marriage around Jesus' presence. And I just sense right here, right now, there is someone in here who came here for that right there. Joseph and Mary centered their marriage around Jesus' presence, and they made it work. Listen, you're here right now, and family life has been killing you. Like you feel like you're dying a death every day in your home and you want to quit. You want to give up. You do. But as long as this is an option in your head, it will always be a temptation. Do not, do not, do not try to fix a smoke detector while ignoring the fire. Your marriage is a smoke detector. God has put marriage in your life to show you all kinds of issues and flaws and stuff that's in you. That's normal. Like, like it's not your kids and your, your wife driving you crazy. Like, you're just crazy and it's okay. Like, me too. But the fire is your heart. And that's what God is after. He's after your heart. But can you be like Jesus? Can you be like Joseph? Can you stay? We're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, you have to know that the proclamation of Christmas is God and sinners reconciled. That Jesus didn't just come to rule and reign, but he came to rescue and reconcile as well. Jesus is the perfect mediator between estranged parties. Because let me tell you something, 30 years 30 plus years after the events in Matthew chapter one, this baby would become a man and he'd be hanging on a cross dying for you and for me. He could have got off if he wanted to, but it was an all in decision. 
For Jesus, there was no contingency plan. There was no plan B. And in the greatest act of love in the history of the world, he stayed. He stayed. What do you do with a God like this? I submit to you, be like Joseph. Can you have the faith to believe in the impossible? John chapter uh, one says that for as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Can you endure some ridicule? Can you do it? Can you endure a little bit of ridicule? Not everyone's gonna be on board with your decision to follow Jesus. It's gonna cost you something to follow Jesus, but never ever forget that it cost Jesus everything to come to you. Should it cost you nothing? And can you stay? Can you stay? Can you do hard things? Can you relinquish control and rather than name Jesus, let him name you? Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for your son who went from cradle to grave and rose again for our victory. I thank you, God, for men of old like Joseph, who was such an example to us of how to react to you as you come into our lives. I'm reminded of something that A.W. Tozer said. He said, God is love and God is sovereign. And his love disposes him to desire our everlasting welfare, but his sovereignty enables him to secure it. And Jesus Christ is the perfect embodiment of love and sovereignty of God. Jesus Christ is here right now. And so with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, if you're here and you would say, Sean, I need to know this Jesus. I know he's crashed into my life and I've had the negative responses to him. I've tried to, 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 to just get away from it and to ignore it. But Jesus Christ is here right now for you. What will you do with this gift on Christmas? If you're saying, Sean, I wanna give my life to Jesus, will you just slip your hand up? Just slip your hand up. I see you, I see you, I see you. About four or five, six people raise their hands. Anyone else? I know you want me to move on. You want me to be quiet, you want me to stop. You want me to, to end the service, but I can't because the spirit of the living God is here. Jesus is here. He's crashed into your life right here, right now. And he's calling. Will you receive him? That's my last call. Slip your hand up. I see you, brother. Father, I just pray for these brave, courageous ones who have made a decision that they know is not popular, who made a decision that they know has implications past just a feel-good service. But as they walk out, it's revolutionary. And so I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you would come into their life, that you would heal them, forgive them of their sins, cleanse them of all unrighteousness, and show them what it's like to be the child of God as they move forward. Lord, we thank you for all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas.